Here at Ringgold, we believe you can't do life alone. In a season where everyone feels disconnected, we want to strive to be more connected. So we want to invite you to join us for our full worship experience on Sunday morning at 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. For the full worship experience, you get to engage in worship, the message, as well as interact with online hosts and other church online members. If you miss church this week, no worries. This week's message is about to begin momentarily. But don't miss out on the full worship experience this coming Sunday, whether it's online or here in person on campus at Ringgold. Hey everyone, welcome to Ringgold. I'm glad that you're with us here today. We're in week number two of a three-part series of messages called Broken Lives Matter. We'll wrap up our series next weekend. We're basically talking about these three core distinctives that we're running after as a church. So we're talking about being humble, hungry, and healthy. Now you say, why would we talk about those things? I would imagine that you know, the one we're talking about today, hungry, needs probably the most explanation of the three. Now, I would imagine hearing the word humble, you're like, of course, the church should be humble. And when you hear the word healthy, I would imagine that you probably know where we're going to go with that one next weekend. But hungry, what is that supposed to mean? I think that you probably know that we're not talking about physical hunger. We're talking about a healthy church, our motivations, our desires, our ambitions. The things that we're chasing after are important. Now, you might think, well, should a church have those things? Should a church have ambition? Should a church set goals? Should a church be driving? Because I could get sideways real quick, and I thought a church was just supposed to be faithful and content. Now, those are really good questions. And that's what we want to talk about and clear up and explain today. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, just turn to Mark chapter 2, and we're going to walk through just a few verses of the story that's there, and we're going to see where we get the word for a church being hungry. Now, contrary to what some might think, we're not in competition with other churches in our community. We're not trying to get better coffee and a more entertaining kids' ministry, and you know, it's not about awesome and powerful worship or funnier messages and effort to try to steal people from other churches. We're not trying to steal disgruntled Christians from other churches in order to grow a bigger church either. The reason we don't try to steal disgruntled Christians is disgruntled Christians are not very fun to be around. (laughs) Have you ever been around one? We are unapologetically going after people who are far from God. Why? Broken lives matter. And broken lives are welcome here. We are striving to be a mended life church. We are unapologetically running after people who don't think they believe in God. We want to reach people who think that they're too smart for God. We want to reach people who think that they're they're good without God or not good enough for God. People who are sort of done with God because they've been burned or bored with religion. We're going after people who have stayed away from church or strayed from church for whatever reason. Now, at this particular moment, If you're already a Christian or a Christ follower, you might say, well, what about us? We're already believers. Is this church for us too? And the answer to that is yes, it is. It's a, this church is for you to come and to get on mission with us as we try to reach more and more people who are really far from God. And then we continue to grow together. Why? We are better together. I love what Pastor Rick Warren said. He said this years ago. He said it takes all kinds of churches to reach all kinds of people. Now, he's talking about all churches who are still looking at the same Jesus. Churches are still teaching the same word, the gospel. Churches who are still talking about the, you know, undeserved grace of God. But different kinds of churches in the sense that we we have a fingerprint that looks similar, but is distinct. 
We need every church to be on top of their game. In fact, when I see a bumper sticker from another church while I'm out traveling, I always take a moment and just reminded to pray for that church, pray for their pastor, pray for their people. I pray that God would bless their church, bless their socks off. In this series, we're focusing on broken lives matter. We're talking about the unique thing that God is doing in and through our church. I just want you to, to know the heart behind this. And I want, to know, I want you to know why we're doing this. Why is this important? Why would we spend three weeks talking about this? This is not about us patting ourselves on the back. This is not to say that we are the best church in our community so that we can gloat, because we're not. We're doing this for three reasons. The first reason, so we can celebrate what God is doing. God is doing some amazing things, even in the midst of the season that we're in right now. Number two, we want to give God the glory for all of this. And three, so we can be as intentional about it as we can. We don't want to drift from our mission. Vision oftentimes leaks. We, we have a tendency, all of us have a tendency to slip into autopilot in our personal lives, and we can easily do this in church. We want to be intentional as we can about this. You know, we want to be intentional about what God is doing. People have asked me at times if I started Ringgold Church. No, we got started in 1898. Now, the reason I point that out is this. The average lifespan of the typical church in America today is 40 to 50 years. 40 to 50 years of effectiveness and fruitfulness before it begins to plateau, decline, close its doors. Roughly 3,000 churches close their doors every year. I think the reason why the average lifespan is 40 to 50 years is because that represents a generation. A generation said, this is how we're going to do things. This is how we like to do things. And we are not going to change. So they fail to pass the baton to the next generation. Now, for whatever reason, God has seen to it that the life cycle of this church has kicked over multiple times for us to be nearly 123 years old. Now it's our watch. It's our turn to actually run the race and pass the baton. The question is this. How do, how do we keep it going? How do we keep it going for the right reasons? Because we don't want to let pride get in the way and self-confidence to set in. We don't want to get overly ambitious. I never want to get too far ahead of God. I want to follow the Lord into where God is leading us. Now, this is where we get the word hungry. The word hungry comes into play here. What do we mean hungry? What do we mean by that? What is it like to be hungry? Think about that for a minute. When is the last time that you were really, really physically hungry? What did it feel like? I think it's a pretty good word to describe the disposition of Jesus, you know, in his earthly ministry 2,000 years ago. He was hungry. He was focused and incredibly motivated by one thing and one thing only, getting people back to God. Jesus didn't come to establish another world religion. Jesus didn't come to run for political office. Jesus didn't come to become the CEO of a major organization. The reason. The reason why he left his throne, the throne room of heaven, and stepped into the back room of Nazareth was people. The reason why Jesus took off his full divinity and clothed himself in frail humanity was people. The reason why Jesus hung on a cross and gave his life and then walked out of the grave three days later was people. In fact, he would say it this way in Luke chapter 19. He said, this is the reason why I have come. And here's the reason. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Wow. To seek and to save those who are lost. Aren't you grateful for that today? These two words, Jesus came to seek out, to save. Save who? The lost. Who are the lost? You and me. It's, it's never us and them, it's you and me. 
We have all been lost at one time or another in our lives. Jesus came for smart people, dumb people, angry people, funny people, boring people, tall people, short people, confident people, insecure people, people who have it all together people, barely keeping it together people, religious people, non-religious people, expressive people, reserved people, broken people, even confused people. In fact, he told a couple of stories one time to demonstrate just how serious he was about this. He said one time there was a shepherd who had 100 sheep and one of them wandered off and he left the 99 perfectly found ones to go find the one, the lost one. One time there was this lady, Jesus said, and she had 10 coins. She lost one. She wrecks her whole house, turned everything upside down to find that one coin, even though she had nine others. Jesus goes, this is the same kind of compassion desire that I have trying to find the one. So the question is this, why did Jesus come? He came to seek and to save. This kept him awake at night and unable to focus on anything else. People kept distracting him from his mission and he kept coming right back to it. He had this, he has a sense of urgency about himself. And so we want to have the same focus, same passion, determination that Jesus modeled for us. Our job is to get everyone to Jesus so they too can be redeemed and put in right standing with God. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Now think about this. Where did Jesus return from? In Luke's gospel, when he talks about this same event, he tells us that just before this, Jesus was teaching in some small villages outside of the Sea of Galilee. This was in the moment that he healed a leper. Now, this may not sound too surprising to us because we sort of think of it like, well, that's what Jesus did. Like every day, that was his ministry, teaching and miracles. Like, hey, Jesus, what'd you do today? Jesus, I walked on water. I fed 5,000 people. I healed a few lepers, and I did that all before breakfast. What did you do today? This was actually the first time that Jesus had healed a leper. Now keep in mind, by the way, at this point, Jesus is 30. He hasn't healed anybody for three decades. You know, the three decades he walked on the planet. For whatever reason, in this moment, Luke tells us that Jesus chooses to heal a leper. Why? What is even more significant is that not only is this the first time Jesus healed a leper, But this is the first time that a leper has been healed since the Mosaic law had been given. Now, the reason this is so significant is because in the Old Testament, there were these prophecies that were given. There were basically messianic prophecies. These prophecies were saying, here's how you will know when the Messiah comes. When you see him, this is what you know. One of them says he'd be born of a virgin. This is why Jesus was born of a virgin, by the way. Nobody else ever has. Another one is that he would heal lepers. This is the first time a leper has been healed since the Mosaic Law. This has gotten the attention of everyone. Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He knew that he was getting ready to set some wheels in motion that would eventually lead him to a cross. Jesus knew this was going to get the attention of the religious leaders. These leaders were scratching their heads going, Who is this unconventional rabbi with this ragtag group of disciples following him? I mean, what does he think he's doing anyways? In Luke chapter 2, verse 2. Soon, the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors, there was no more room, even outside the door. This place is packed out. Why would all these people show up at this house? What would be their possible motivation? Well, Jesus just healed a leper. I would imagine that for men, they're like, we want to see this Jesus, and we want to see him do another trick, another miracle. Some of them were thinking, man, they showed up because they had some selfish motives for being there. What can Jesus, what can Jesus do for me today? That's why they were probably there. There were some religious leaders who showed up. They showed up because they were testing Jesus. They were critiquing Jesus. In a typical religious leader fashion, they show up and they take all of the VIP seats right up front. The place is packed out. 
There's no room for anyone else to get in, even outside the door. And Jesus just starts teaching. In Luke chapter 2, verse 2, while he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Now, get this picture in your mind. Four guys show up late carrying a friend of theirs on a mat. Now, their friend is paralyzed. How did he get paralyzed? We don't know. But chances are, he has been in this condition for a very long time. And what we do know is that this would have been a death sentence in this culture. This was long before the days of health care and workers' comp and wheelchair accessibility. If you were paralyzed, then you didn't have very many options in front of you. Now, my guess, my guess is that this guy didn't even want to be there. Chances are, he's already tried several things to get better and nothing has ever worked. He's gotten his hopes up before. You know, in the past, he got his hopes up and just to be let down. Others have tried to step in and help, but it only hurt. It never helped. But on this particular day, people who were part of the religious system in particular, they would, they would have made somebody like him feel really, really bad about himself because they would have suggested that he had sinned. The reason you're like this, you know, you've sinned, you've done something wrong, wrong against God. This is why, you know, you're, you've been found guilty. You're paralyzed. God was punishing him. And my guess is that they, you know, he probably avoided public places for a long time, especially religious ones. And he didn't want to be there. But it says that his friends bring him on a mat anyway. Now, my guess is that one of those friends had been sitting in the crowd in one of those little villages outside of the Sea of Galilee. Lou tells us about it, and he watched Jesus, and he probably seen that first miracle. That he probably saw that miracle of that leper being healed. And all of a sudden, the light bulb goes off in his mind. He says, if, if Jesus can do that for this guy, I got a friend back home, and maybe he can do that for him too. So about the time Jesus comes to Capernaum, he willingly gives up his seat in the house and goes to get his friend with his three other buddies. And they show up late. And it says this in Luke chapter 2, verse 4. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of a crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head and then lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. So notice you got Bubba and Cletus and Butch and Scooter all up on the roof. And just a bunch of good old boys. And they're just doing what you know good old boys would do. They're going to do whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus. So they're not following the rules of religious etiquette. They didn't have theological pedigree. They had just seen what Jesus could do in the life of another person by healing them, and they wanted their friend to experience it too. Now, when we go to the Gospel of Mark, Mark shows us the reason why they couldn't get their buddy to Jesus. It had to do with the crowd, this huge crowd. And this is important to note. The roof wasn't really the barrier. The barrier was the crowd. The crowd was in the way. The crowd was not at all interested in helping. They were just there to either get something from Jesus or try to catch Jesus in something. Now, the Greek verb that is used here implies that these four friends were trying very hard. Going through the roof was not their first option. They resorted to that option because the crowd kept blocking them every step of the way. Their hunger was to get their friend to Jesus. Their hunger led them. This hunger led them to innovation, this passion that caused them to go through the roof. Think about all the other ways that they could have responded in that moment as they walked out there with their buddy on that mat. I mean, they see all the pickup trucks parked out front and everything's crowded. They, they could have just stopped and said, well, sorry, buddy, we tried. We tried really hard, but it's crowded. There's no way in. There's just no way we can get you in there. Now, here is the rational response. Here's why I think I probably, this is probably what I would have said. Why don't we just wait? Why don't we just wait outside here till the service is over and everybody just kind of goes their way, disperses? 
We'll just wait in line. Maybe Jesus will give us a few minutes. We'll, we'll get you to him. Let's just wait a minute. Why didn't they do that? Why didn't they wait just a moment? And my guess is that the paralyzed man didn't want to be there. My guess is he's like, guys, I just want to go home. I'm tired of the shame. I'm tired of the judgmental looks. Jesus is just going to reject me anyways. This isn't going to work. We tried this before. I mean, he would have tried to probably wear him down. You know, take me home, take me home. He would have figured out a way to get out of there at some point. But their hunger, his friend's hunger said, we can't wait around. We got to get you. We got to get our friend to Jesus as fast as we possibly can. So they climb up on the roof. They punch a hole in the roof and they lower their friend to Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, verse 5, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. In other words, these four guys loaned this paralyzed man some of their faith. Jesus saw the power of their faith. And so he turns to their friend, this paralyzed man, and they said, you know, and he said, what, what, is, what is he going to say in this moment? And this is where it gets really suspenseful. At this moment, Jesus stops preaching. The house gets quiet because, I mean, all this debris is falling down. <laughs> this paralyzed man's coming down out of the ceiling. He's being lowered, you know, into the middle of the room. I mean, that is a speaker's like worst fear coming true right in the middle of your message. And everybody's looking at him. Can you imagine the fear on this paralyzed man? And Jesus turns. You know, he's probably picking ceiling tile out of his hair, out of his beard. What's Jesus going to say? Is he going to get angry? Is he going to be mad? Is he going to be annoyed? Is he going to throw him out? You know, how about this? Is he going to, is he going to heal him? That'd be great if he'd heal him right here, right then, right? But here's what Jesus said. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. What? It's kind of unusual, isn't it? Now, I want you to picture this in your minds. You got, remember Butch and Bubba and Cletus and Scooter all on top of the roof. They're all up on the roof looking down through the hole that they just made in this roof. And they're trying to hear what's going on. And one of them goes, what did he say? He's saying his sins are forgiven. What? Jesus. Hey, we don't want to be ungrateful and all that, but you know, this is pretty cool stuff, you know, that you can forgive his sins. And you know, we're thankful that you can heal his sins, but come on, Jesus. I think I like I think there's been a misunderstanding because he ain't done nothing wrong. He's he's a good dude. Did you notice his legs? They don't work. You need to do something about this, Jesus. That'd be awesome if you would. Why did Jesus forgive his sins? It is so clear. It is so clear that what the guy needs right here, right in front of him, Jesus is trying to make a couple of different points through this move by saying this. But here is the one that I want to kind of tuck away and put in your back pocket. You, know, to, you can take this with you today because somebody today needs to hear this. Why this is important, what Jesus says. Jesus, Jesus' biggest priority is to reconcile you back to God, not just meet all your immediate needs. Now, please don't misunderstand me. Jesus cares deeply about your immediate needs. He's going to heal this guy's legs, but his first number one priority is reconciling you back to God. His first priority is restoring what has been taken from you. His first priority is to get you to heaven. His first priority is to say, I want you to spend eternity with me. Jesus wants to spend eternity with you. Jesus refuses to be your cosmic vending machine where you just pump in a few prayers and you get back whatever you want. Jesus says, no. Priority number one, I'm going to demonstrate this for you and everybody else here today. I want to reconcile you back to God. So he says, son, your sin." Are forgiven. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And some of the teachers of the religious law who were sitting there thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? 
And then he asked this incredible question, and it's a little bit confusing, so pay close attention to what Jesus says here. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, Why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? This is a great question that Jesus poses to all of them. He is basically saying, it's easier for me to say that your sins are forgiven. And it's much, much harder to actually heal the guy. Now, why is that the case? Now, let me just kind of try to demonstrate this for you here. I could simply just point to you and, and say, you know, right there where you're sitting, your sins are forgiven. There you go. Aren't you glad you came today on church online? It's a good day. You know, or I could say, oh, you know, th that whole family sitting right there on the couch. Your sins are forgiven. Sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? You know, you know wish you were more grateful. You know, this is super easy. You, know, you got no way to prove it. Talk is cheap. You know, it'd be much harder if somebody had a broken arm. There's no way I'm bringing you know, a guy up here today with a broken arm and go, heal. I can't do that. And you know, Jesus is basically trying to demonstrate here that he is the bridge back to God. So he forgives the guy's sins first to sort of get their attention. Because they're like, what are you doing? Luke chapter 2, verse 10. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus says, I will prove to you. Those are big words. And then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sin. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Wow, he forgave. Jesus forgave his sins, and then he met his need. He did it for this guy. And guess what? He will do this for you, too. Here's three questions. Who is your friend on a map? Those of you who have given your life to Jesus, I just want you to stop and just think about this for a moment. If you've not, if you've not done this yet, you're in the right place. We're, we're glad that you're here. But for those of you who are following Jesus, who is your mat bound friend? I want you to think about this. Get this person, his or her face in your mind. Think about their name right now. Who would you love to get to Jesus? But maybe there's something significant standing in the way of getting them to Jesus, making that happen. Maybe it's his or her beliefs or her choices, his past, her pain. Maybe it's his lifestyle, her questions, his objections, her skepticism, or his mistakes. Who is that one person? You kind of snicker a little bit because you're like, well, it, it would take nothing short of a miracle to get him to Jesus, to get, to get her to hear Jesus, to see Jesus. This is the person who I want you to think about for just a moment. Now, now that you've got that person on your mind, I want you to ask God to develop a passion within you and a sense of urgency within you to get him or her to Jesus. Now, I know all about the objections. You know, I'm not talking about being weird. I'm not talking about being obnoxious or pushy. I'm talking about just being authentic. In fact, I'm not even talking about you even saying a word to them just yet. I wouldn't even suggest that you say a word to them until you've cried over them, until you prayed over them. I'm talking about the prayers that you pray over them that will move you to compassion for a broken heart, a broken life. Are they urgent? I'm not talking about you pushing your beliefs on them. I'm talking about you saying, I don't have all the answers. I'm not perfect. But come and see. Come and see a man, Jesus, who changed my life. I believe he can do this for you too. 
You see, these four friends, they put everything on the line. They put their reputations on their line, their finances, their safety to get their friend, who I'm guessing didn't even want to be there, to Jesus. And I bet you later that night, he thanked them greatly for it. My question to you is this, who in heaven will walk up to you with tears and say, thank you so much for not walking away from me. Even though I cussed at you, I froze you out, I annoyed you greatly. Thank you so much for having that compassion. I didn't see it then, but I see it now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Or will you be standing in the corner somewhere all alone? Here's the next question. What is your way? Acts chapter 15, verse 1. While Paul and Barnabas were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Today, it's not circumcision, thankfully. And all the men said, Amen. What these men were saying, in other words, they were saying, it is this, circumcision plus Jesus, or Jesus plus all this other stuff that saves you. It's this kind of mentality that still exists today. It's Jesus plus this. We tend to blur the lines between personal and spiritual growth. A very fancy word for this is called sanctification. After we give our life to Jesus, after we walk out of the baptistry, we, we are all kind of works in progress, broken lives being put back together, mended by Christ, growing to be more and more like Jesus. That's called sanctification. Basically, it's more and more of Jesus and less and less of me until, you know, it's Christ alone in me. We say Jesus plus worship music. That's what saves you. Jesus plus Bible study. Jesus plus abstinence. Jesus plus church attendance. Jesus plus hand raising. Jesus plus fasting. And, and the list goes on and on. Now, please do not misunderstand me. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do those things. That's not what I'm saying. In fact, I think that you should. They're all great ideas. It's just that nobody is saved by those things. They're not salvation issues. Here's the big mistake that many of us make. We take the personal convictions and the tools that we use to grow spiritually, and we tend to place them on people who have not yet come to Christ. And they become, what these things become is unnecessary barriers that they can't see beyond. They can't see beyond these things because some things you won't be able to see until you give your life to Jesus, until Jesus gives you the eyes to see them, why they're important. So Peter stands up in Acts chapter 15, and this is what he says. Acts chapter 15. God knows people's hearts. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. He has made no distinction between us and them, for he cleansed their hearts through faith. So, why are you now challenging God by burdening the Gentile believers with a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors were able to bear? We believe that we are all saved the same way, by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. And then, the brother of Jesus, James chimes in with this. Acts chapter 15, verse 19. And so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. What is James saying? Broken lives matter. These people matter. Broken lives are welcome here. And broken lives are amended by Christ. We want to remove any unnecessary barriers that will keep people from Jesus. We need to remove. Removing unnecessary barriers does not mean that we're watering down the gospel. It does not mean we're caving in the culture or lowering, lowering the bar. It doesn't mean that we are sacrificing personal holiness or conviction. We want to be crystal clear on the essentials for salvation. Grace alone, by faith alone, through Christ alone. And everything else is a matter of opinion or personal preference. Let's not be like the crowds back at the house at Capernaum. While they were listening to the message from Jesus, 
their backs were turned towards people outside who needed to get to Jesus, totally unaware that there was somebody outside who needed Jesus' touch. The word picture I'm trying to paint here is this. When the experience of those inside the house is prioritized over the needs of those outside of the house, this is when we, the church, care more about the way that we like it rather than how we can reach more people for Jesus. And this is really tragic. When some finally decide to accept an invitation to come to church, they finally give church a try. They come, and what they find is a self-centered church. When we say that we want to be hungry, what we mean as a church is we're striving. We're striving. We, We have a bias towards action, not apathy. We have a bias towards the broken, not the perfect. We have a bias to take some risk and not play it safe. We have a bias towards the unconventional and innovative, not the safe and predictable. We have a bias for what we bring to it, not just what we get out of it. We have a bias towards grace, and this is tethered to the truth to truth, delivered in love. So here's the third question. Are you willing to wreck the roof? Are you willing to wreck the roof? Will you decide today that it isn't just going to be about me? It's not going to be just about you. It's going to be about others who are far from God, who are broken. We're going to wreck some roofs to get people to Jesus. I am so grateful because I believe we have a church of roof wreckers who are willing to not play it safe, but to do whatever it takes. I believe it's on our hearts. We're striving to be a hospital for sinners and not a hotel for saints. Now, we're going to have to be willing to wreck some of some more roofs to get people to Jesus because the need, the need is so great. We live in a world that is looking desperately for hope and help. Jesus said, I have given you my undeserved grace, not for you to keep it to yourself, but for you to go out and wreck wreck some roofs to get others to me. As a church, we will never stop until the one has come home. Why? Broken lives matter. And broken lives are welcome here. And broken lives are mended by Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. God, I pray that you would break our hearts for what breaks yours. I pray that you would give us a hunger, a hunger to go after people who are far from you. And we would do it for the right reasons. We're not just trying to grow as a church. We're not in competition with other churches. We're trying to reach people who are far from you, that they would see Jesus through us. God, please give us the strength to remember our experience of grace to never forget what it was like so that we can go and you know maybe wreck some more roots to get people to Jesus because you're the only one who can change anyone. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. God bless you. As a church, it's an honor and a pleasure to be a part of what God is doing in your life. So thanks for joining us today. But what now? To find out what your next steps are to grow in your relationship with Christ, be sure to visit ringgoldchurch.com. At Ringgold, we believe growing people change. So we want to invite you to join us for Mended Life Talk on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. We will be diving deeper into this week's message with questions, scripture, and challenges to go deeper in our faith walk. If you haven't already done so, now is a great time to set up online giving. We want to thank you for financially giving to Ringgold Church so we can continue to serve and make an impact in our different communities and our world. Giving is an important step in our spiritual growth and maturity. You can give online through the Ringgold Church app or at ringgoldchurch.com. If you are not comfortable with giving online, you can also visit ringgoldchurch.com to view other possible ways to give as well. Well, thanks for hanging out with us today. We can't wait to see you next time at Ringgold Church Online.